All right, good evening. Um, welcome to Thursday. And again, we have another great Make It Alexandria episode tonight with the always lovely Elisa Kovach of Alexandria Makers Market. Tonight, Elisa is welcoming Sue of Toulouse, and we're going to get to see all of her wonderful art and home goods and just these beautiful pieces that she creates and designs all herself. So let's welcome Elisa. Happy Thursday, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on Make It Alexandria. I am really excited to have Sue join us. Sue and I have been friends for many years at this point and have done um, different events together. And I just am a huge fan of her work. So I can't wait to just um, dive a little deeper with her and get to know her and for you guys at home to see a little bit more uh, behind the veil of what she does. So um, Sue, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. And I am a big fan of yours too. You are a oh. great asset to our entire Alexandria community and well appreciated. Thank you. I, I, I That's very kind. Thank you so much. Um, for those who haven't had the introduction to Toulouse, would you just give us an overview of a little bit about you and a little bit about the brand? Sure. So, um, my name's Sue, obviously, and I live right here in Delray. And I am a lifelong artist. I've um, started out going to art school at the tender age of 18 in Philadelphia and was in the sculpture and ceramics department for four years and got a BFA in those subjects and then built uh, life-size figurative work for years and out in California. And as I moved back east, my work got smaller and sort of more home goods oriented, more away from sculpture and more into uh, platters and tableware and things like that. And then uh, I think about 12 years ago, we built our home and I didn't want to trash it with uh, clay dust. So I kind of put my business on hold. We had two very young boys. They were uh, one and a half and three at the time that we moved in here. And I stopped making art. And after a few years, I really thought that was going to be the end and I wasn't going to be making art anymore. And it was sort of uh, a little bit of a bummer, but a little bit like, you know, we just move on to different things in our life. And then I just got an itch many years later and I dug out this bin of um, prints that I had made years before and I just started embroidering on them and I I made a very conscious decision to turn my monkey mind off and not question what I was doing I was in between jobs and um, my kids were getting a little bit older they were in elementary school I guess and I just said, just stop, just turn it off. Just so, just so, don't worry about it, just so. <laughs> and so I, I did that until I had about 20 or 30 pieces of, of fabric that was printed on and then it was embroidered on. And I decided to make them into clutches, which I had no idea how to sew anything. So to pick something that's as difficult as a multi-layered clutch was not the brightest thing, but I figured it out. And they were pretty rudimentary, but they were nice and they were cute. And I had a pop-up shop and I also had some pillows and some other things and I sold out. And so I thought, well, maybe it's time to give this a try again. And so I built a website that February and launched it and again, sold out of work that I had. And, um, and it just sort of has gone from there, one step, really one step in front of the other, trying to figure it out and trying to marry this sort of entrepreneur mind that I have, because I've tried to start other businesses in the past, all always around the arts, right? Um, and this artistic mind, which is messy and unorganized and um, is a force to be reckoned with also. <laughs> so marrying those two things have, has been pretty interesting and out of it, I've grown my business, which is Toulouse. And um, I love it. I don't want to do anything else. The hours peel away in my studio like nobody's business. And uh, that's it. So here we are. I don't know. I think I'm year six, maybe into this. Yeah. Well, it you would never know that it's year six. It, it, your products are so seamless. And like the designs are so honed that it feels like this is probably what you've been doing forever from somebody who is outside of, you know, looking in. 
Um, but tell me about those kind of early designs that you worked with in terms of what you were printing and mm -hmm. were you experimenting with different fabrics? Did you gravitate to just the canvas and the, um, the cotton and the, you know, those things right did, away? Yeah. What were those yes. early steps? So, so I, I'm a total bootstrapper. Like there's been no monetary investment really from anybody in this business. So it's really, at first it was like, what do I have at home that I can make this stuff out of and then get a return on it? And then how do I take that return and turn that into more product and make a little bit more money? So it's always been that kind of bootstrapping mentality. So at first it was canvas. That's what I made everything out of um, because that's what the prints were on in the beginning that I had already, that I pulled out from underneath our day bed. And then I did some cotton and then I did a lot of um, scrap fabric, I guess. So things that I had lying around, I would use for like the backs of pillows and then have the print on the front. And then I discovered linen and I just, that was it. I have a big love for linen and I think it's a beautiful material. It's an heirloom material, which means it can be passed down from generation to generation. And you can kind of see that when you go to flea markets and things like that, um, you'll see like old linen that have, has been embroidered like pillowcases and things. You can imagine your grandmother sitting around and doing it. And it's been literally passed down from generation to generation. It gets better over time. And I just love that about it. So it's easy to take care of. People sometimes think maybe it's hard to take care of because you can't throw it in the dryer, but it saves energy, right? Like you just throw it in the washer, you lay it flat to dry, pull it a little bit, and then you really don't have to iron it unless you're a super tight corner type A person, which is fine. <laughs> then you can iron your linen all you want. Uh, but I try to stay away from ironing it if I can. So I, that's what I use primarily. I use linen. I use a little bit of flour sack material um, for some tea towels, but linen is the big thing for me. And I pretty much make everything that I make is made out of that. Um, and as far as the process goes, um, I'm a block printer. And I don't think I mentioned that in the beginning. So um, what that means is that I, I create an image, I draw an image, and then I flip it over onto, uh, or I trace it rather, and then I flip it over onto a block. And the block is this, I'll show you this guy. I don't know if you can see that there. So the, here's a butterfly and it's this rubbery block. You can get it at Michael's. You can buy it online at, um, at Dick Blick, which is an art supply store. And then there are carving tools. I don't have one up here. And you just, so you have the image that's been transferred to this and you carve out the negative space. So you're carving out, um, it's really hard to like look at this and try to talk to you here. So like you're carving out this stuff. So the ink obviously is not going to transfer onto that when you roll it onto your block. And what you're left with is what is going to come in the print. So that's a block that I carved. Here's another, here's a snake. I'm big into snakes. I love snakes. Um, they're great for pattern. I don't really love snakes. Actually, I'm afraid of snakes, but <laughs> they are, they're great for um, pattern and color and texture. So they're really good vehicles for all the things that I love. Um, and yeah, so I, as I said, inspired by nature for sure. Um, I do a lot of flowers. I do a lot of animals. Um, and um, that's kind of my jam. So you can find like table linens and napkins, table runners, tea towels, cocktail napkins, things like that. And you can find pillows or you can even block print a bathroom. If you have a block um, that you've carved, you can ink it up um, and literally print. There you go, right there's a bathroom that I printed in California at my friend Sarah's house. Um, so you just block right onto the walls and it's a great solution um, to not having to put up wallpaper, right? You can paint over it. And um, if you don't like it anymore, or if you're renting, you can kind of just paint over it and you know say your goodbyes to your landlord and um, have this really beautiful effect um, that doesn't have to stay or can stay forever. Um, the new thing that I'm doing now, which I'm most excited about because it's not printing at all. And for me, somebody that prints pretty much on the daily, like I, I've spent a lot of time printing. Um, it's really fun to do a new, um, have a new experience, right? So I started 
kind of looking and studying something called shibori, which is basically a fancy name for tie dye. Um, it's a Japanese tradition of folding um, and tying um, your fabric in order to dye it. So I took the inks that I normally use on the rest of my um, products, which I, I hand mix everything myself, you know, I'll combine colors. So all the colors are very kind of unique and original, and it's a big part of what I love is color. So, and then started dyeing these, my napkins and other things. And so let's see, you can see, so it has this great effect. And I don't know if you can see, but there's like gold sparkly in there. Like there's several layers that are kind of painted on when the whole thing is, is uh, tied up. And then you open it up and it's like, you know, you get this little present because you never really know what it's going to look like until you open it, which is kind of cool. So there's napkins, there's runners. There's also these really fun new dab kits, which I'm, and these are all in Shibori kind of, that's a sparkly pink on top of that mango. Um, so yeah, that's it. I don't I, even remember what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was incredible. And that um, really gave kind of a really good explanation of, of your process from start to finish. But I am sitting here and wondering, that seems like an incredible amount of time to draw the artwork, to carve it out. And then just, I'm assuming you have to roll it each time you're gonna print. What would something like that from start to finish, if the butterfly, for example, what would that take time-wise? Time, time -wise? Um... Well, drawing it was probably, it depends on your skill level, of course. It depends on, you know, how exacting you want things. I don't really care about things being super exact or, um, you know, like a mirror image. And, you know, butterflies are usually a mirror image. I can guarantee you that is not one. Um, and so it just sort of depends on whose hand is, is working it. But for me, the butterfly was probably about an hour to draw. And then it was probably like, I don't know, an hour and a half to carve, maybe not super long. It's the material is very flexible. It's actually called easy cut. Mm. Um, so you can imagine that it is easy to cut. And <laughs> um, the tools that I use kind of pull away at the, um, at the block, which it's, it's almost like drawing. Like I'm, I'm not a very good two dimensional artist. I've never have been. I was horrible at it at school. Three dimensional is really where I come from and it's much easier for me for some reason. So carving for me is actually like drawing. Like I, I may sketch out something and then where the detail comes in and where I really kind of feel the flow and can get into sort of the shapes of everything is with the actual carving of the tool, uh, you know, with the tool. Yeah. Do you think your pottery background is helpful at this point? Cause I know that depending on what kind of pottery, uh, you work with, there is some carving and creating that negative space. Yeah. So, I mean, this was a hundred years ago, right? Um, but my senior thesis in school, it, were, it was very dark, I have to tell you. Um, like it was like all of these women with giant fish coming out of their backs and like their spines coming open. And it was, their bodies were completely carved and almost tattooed sort of. So that's where when I kind of started carving this and when I got, I originally got the itch to start making something again, I wanted to carve something like I carved clay. And this was really the perfect medium because I wasn't like making this crazy dusty mess that my little boys were going to just like, you know, they would walk into my studio and, you know, they just look at something and it breaks, you know how it is. And <laughs> so, right? and so this was a great way to, um, to just pick, uh, like, just, you know, get that feeling of carving and making something that I was used to, um, satisfied, right. With the carving. It's fun. Well, I've taught kids that's that are incredible. five. I mean, anybody can do it. It's not like I have, it's not rocket science, seriously. Anybody can do it. Well, I'm a little bit intimidated. Uh, you talk about how your two dimensional drawings are maybe not as sharp as you know when you carve so i get a little anxious thinking about how to create that depth and how that would really work in reality for me so um i yeah. think you just have the skill for it that's it's really incredible yeah. um but 
I want to talk about your colors, though, as well, because I think that that is maybe one of your signature pieces, even though that's not really, you know, it's not a specific design. But your colors are very, very vibrant. And so the fact that you are uh, mixing them yourself, I was not aware of that. That's that's another part of this that is that something you were doing before or is, was that just you? Yeah, um, well, in, in, with clay, yes, because when you mix your own glaze, you really can, it's science, right? So you can add certain chemicals and you will get different um, reactions when it's being fired in the kiln to create a cobalt blue or a brown or whatever. So you can put a little bit more pigment in or put a, bit, a little bit less in, obviously on a scale and very scientifically unless you're me because that's not my role so it's like it, it really is um I, i've gotten better at writing down the recipe it took me four and a half years to start doing that but i kept you know it was like every time i made coral it was a little bit different and so now i'm, I'm much i'm a little more scientific about it i would say but yeah i've, I've been mixing my own colors since the beginning because i don't I don't know, like some, a couple of the colors come out of the bottle, but really not very many. Most of them are some sort of adaptation of that. But my favorite thing about the colors, I was telling my husband this earlier, is that I get to name them. And it's so much fun to name colors. Like, you know, you can be totally nutty about it or, you know, avant-garde about it or whatever. And it's kind of fun. I like naming Okay, colors. so I've got it. I've got to ask, what are some of the ones that you are, are most endearing to you? Okay, well, so for this season, I'll talk about this season. This one we came up with yesterday, this green, we're calling it forest floor, which is kind of sweet, even though, you know, and then I'm thinking about it and writing this into my, into my um, website as I'm adding images. And I'm like, well, forest floor is really dark, right? Like, because it's like, dark and like the force like everything's decaying but that's okay this is going to be forced floor anyway and then this one um, my husband actually named tonight and it's tango which you, like Cute. it feels like tango doesn't it i thought he nailed that and then there's like peacock blue I've, that's been a kind of a standard one i've done for a while what else do we have this year um oh my son i let my son name one and it's uh, mountain silver it was called black licorice. And then I was like, you know, black licorice is really black. And this is like a pewter to silver ombre. So that doesn't make any sense. So he was like, how about mountain silver? I was like, done. Let's go. That's it. <laughs> I love this. This has become a family affair that it's not just you um, toiling away that, you know, everybody gets to it's just me toiling. Believe me, it's a, that's about as family affair as the thing gets. Unless I beg. <laughs> Well, and, and only because we've been friends for years, I do know that you spend a lot of late nights in your studio. And so because everything is hand sewn, hand block printed, you know, everything is by hand. There's not a lot of um, parts that can be automated. Am I correct with that? That is correct. Yeah, it, um, it's I'm trying to get better at that. Um, and I, I crossed one bridge with that, this, for this season, this fall, um, which is like, I, you know, I got all my designs made. I got linen, um, literally fabricated exactly the way I wanted it. And now my, my napkins and my runners and my tea towels are being sewn off premises. And I'm so thankful every time I just pull one down from the shelf and I get to print on it. You know, it's not any cheaper than me doing it myself. It's probably more expensive, but it's um, a big relief on my time constraints sure. because apparently somebody keeps telling me there's only 24 hours in a day. Um, <laughs> I, I use a lot of them and I'm trying to get better though. I'm trying to give myself a bedtime. I mean, before uh, two. It I'm is, fine. it is. Sorry, I am frozen. Maybe, maybe, oh, there no, we go. Um, there is a storm. <laughs> there is a storm passing through, and my Wi-Fi is being a little fussy. But I'm, I apologize. Um, so now that that is one small piece that you do not have to take on hands on yourself. Um, yeah. Hopefully, that's freed you up to maybe pursue some different collaborations or projects. Is there anything kind of in the works um, with maybe a 
some other folks around town? Um, I don't have anything this year on the books. I am doing um, something called the Creative Collective, which is at Tyson's Corner. I did it two years ago before the pandemic. I guess it was the it, was it the Christmas before the pandemic? I'm so lost in time right now, right? Um, I think, yeah, two Christmases ago, not last Christmas, but yeah, the one before. And um, that's uh, about five or six weeks. And it's at the old Our, Our House store, which is a big furniture store in Tyson's Corner. And so there's maybe going to be about 15 or 20, maximum 20, probably 15 artists from the area that are showing their work whole weeks and it's pretty you know pretty hardcore like you have to get a, have a lot of product ready to go because you also have to work the shop and all that stuff so that's happening from mid-november to um and for till christmas eve i guess so that's a big thing and then i, I think i'm going to be part of a collective that's at george in georgetown as well um, i'm not 100 percent sure on that and then I'm, i kind of bop around during the holidays to different pop-up shops we'll do port city together that was so much fun last time and uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be at the sidewalk sale, right? But besides that, like actual collaborations with other people. Oh, I do have one. What am I saying? I should be wearing one. Uh, Mara and I, do you, you remember Mara mm -hmm. from Demar, Demar and Des She and I are doing a line of headbands this year. We did one last year. Um, throughout the year, we kept changing it depending on the season. And we're doing one that's like a, a lot of the shibori pieces and then we're adding kimonos to it which is really exciting oh, i am really really doing. excited about that <laughs> that is going to be a lot of fun i think um and and i just love that they're kind of this you're pulling some other folks in from around town um so i can't wait to yeah. see the kimonos it's i'm really fun. excited yeah mara and i met at a fabric at fabric based over on one and um, we met standing in line talking to each other and like have completely stayed connected ever since. She's a lovely human being. I think that we probably can't go through this episode though also without mentioning your masks and because of this pandemic and now that Delta variant is becoming more prevalent. You gave me a number over the weekend. We saw each other and um, it was incredible. How many masks do you think that you've made you know in the last year and a half or so um we moved over fourteen thousand masks so um there were some that were not made in house that i just like got some somebody needed them and needed a lot of them and they needed them fast so i got the job done for them um but yeah all the rest were made on the premises stamped here pleated here you know we added their little accoutrements here and then sent them out. It was nuts. It would, I think I posted something on Instagram like the day before the CDC said we needed to wear masks and it was just like one of those timing things. And I'd been just making them to donate to Health and Human Services and um, my friend Amy Smucker and I kind of started doing, I started doing it and then she came on board and then you know, donation stuff like I help when I could along the way, but she kind of took over that because it was, instantly overwhelming i've never seen anything like it it was crazy and i didn't want anyone to be without a mask so i was like really that was like 19 hours a day for about three months i'm like i'm not exaggerating but i love what i do I, so I, <laughs> I think that is no exaggeration i know that you were probably swamped and i think probably the reason is if you're gonna have to wear a mask you might as well look good doing it and and of course yours are so bright and cheerful so <laughs> Um, I'm also going, again, we saw each other over the weekend at Christmas in July and you guys, I really have to show off what I bought because I really oh. am so in love with it. That's awesome. And so it, it, it is probably the, the most favorite thing that I've seen. I saw it at a previous show and I you know, hemmed and hawed over it. Um, but I gotta know if there's going to be a larger dodo bird line because I feel like I need it all. Well, if you need a dodo bird, I will make you a larger dodo bird. Or actually, you know what? You know what the big thing this year, um, you know, we can talk about your dodo bird after the show. Um, but sure. and I'm happy to make you a dodo bird or multiple. We could do a repeat pattern dodo bird maybe 
And, um, but the big thing I think this year is mushrooms. I feel like mushrooms are going to have their like heyday and, um, I'm really into them. I have a, a block I haven't quite printed yet. And I was trying to find it downstairs. It's about, well, you can't see, can you see all my hands right now? Sure. Can you see both of them? So it's about this big, maybe 18 inches tall, and we're going to make it into a stuffed mushroom. It's going to be cute. <laughs> oh my gosh. You gotta there, love a actually, good that, that brings up a good point. Are there some patterns that you're kind of retiring? You feel like they've, they've oh. been maximized and now. Yeah. Great question. Hold on one second. My family's here. Hi family. Please be quiet. <laughs> um, so retiring patterns. The first three patterns I had were the pineapple flower, uh, the big feather and, oh, yeah. and, uh, uh, the mom, which is like a big kind of burst and they don't get retired. The feather has never been retired at all ever. It's been every season and it's always been a bestseller. The mum and the pineapple flower, I'm kind of, I kind of weave in and out. Like some seasons they're there and then some they're not. I'm trying to think if I've read any actual pattern. Probably not. No. They just go and then they come back. and Or they change. Like the snakes. I've, I have probably like 15 carved snakes in my drawers. Um, my, I have these big file, kind of flat file cabinets that I keep all my blocks in. And um, I just keep making more and then I use those and, you know, favorites show up time and time again when you have those multiple print things. So do you have a favorite? I know you mentioned you love your snakes, but is that the, the favorite? Um, that's, I don't get it's like saying who's your favorite child. I mean, <laughs> um, I love I really like snakes because you can just totally do so many different things. And I've done a lot of embroidery on the snakes in the past. I don't know if you remember those clutches that I used to do, they had heavy embroidery on them. And I would just spend hours, like if I watched a movie, I'd be embroidering. If I was at a, my kid's basketball game, I would be embroidering. Um, and I just don't have the time for that anymore. So those are, those definitely have been retired, that kind of level of embroidery. Um, so snakes I like, and then uh, the feather. I have feathers, like one of my favorites all time. Yeah, the big one. The, the feather is beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous. I like the snakes too, but that's because I actually happen to like snakes in general. But uh, go. for that's a topic for a different discussion. Yeah. Well, um, I was stopped. So Delray. Yeah. Sorry. So sorry. No, my internet is not cooperating at the moment. Okay. I just wanted to ask for those people who are checking out the things that you've shown and that I've showed off and thinking, okay, I've got to get some or even just a mask. What is the best way for them to get a hold of you? Well, a couple of ways. My website, which is uh, Toulousa.com, T-U-L-U-S-A.com, um, or Instagram, I'm Toulousa.goods on Instagram, and you can follow me there. That's where you see really like what happens in the studio. I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but as much as I can, like that, the, when things show up in my head and then I carve the block and then I print them, Instagram for sure is the first person. Um, so that's the best place to see the freshest stuff. Um, and then, you know, if anybody has a store out there, I do do wholesale so that you can contact me about. Um, but yeah, those two places, you can email me from my website or you can message me from Instagram. Um, I'd say those two things. Oh, and then also I do have an ebook that just, I just kind of published. I wouldn't, you know, not in a big way or anything, but I, I wrote it right when the pandemic started because I figured people would want to do stuff with their kids and just got way too busy. And I, I just couldn't finish it until very recently. And so it's up on my website and I think you guys might drop a link somewhere in the chat and um, you can sign up and get the ebook and it talks about like, you know, block printing with strawberries or potatoes or, you know, a piece of rope and stuff like that. It's kind of fun. Like you can just do it with your kids and have a good time figuring it out. I think that's so fun. And uh, that is actually up my kid's alley. So I can't wait to check that out. That's, that's really great. Um, so I have really, really enjoyed uh, getting to know a little bit behind the scenes. Um, and I hope that everybody else out there um, is going to go and at least go check you out on Instagram where they can kind of get that 
deeper dive. Um, but I just appreciate you being here. And um, guys, she and I will be um, in Del Rey on Sunday, August 15th, I believe is the day for the sidewalk sale. Um, so I will look forward to seeing you in a few weeks, my friend. I can't wait. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Everybody else, go. Um, as you're going through this week, please shop local whenever possible. Uh, make it Alexandria always and go be the good news in someone's life.